Good afternoon. Welcome to yet another webinar hosted by the Malaysian Chamber of Commerce, Hong Kong and Macau. My name is Lawrence Liu. And I'm the Deputy Chairman of the Malaysian Chamber of Commerce, Hong Kong and Macau. In Hong Kong, we are known as Maycham. The title of today's talk, Sabah 2020 election. What happened and what's next for Malaysia? Just for information, uh, the event will be on the Facebook Live as well as we speak. And uh, for those who probably have to run away from anywhere else, please you can log into the Facebook, through our Maycham Facebook. Okay, before I go into the talk, please allow me to introduce Maycham. Maycham was formed in January 2014. We are now seven years old. Although Malaysians have been in Hong Kong for much longer. So Maycham was formed to promote support, represent the interests of the bis Malaysian business community in Hong Kong, Macau and South China. It is a platform for Malaysians to interact as well as for other communities in Hong Kong to interact with Malaysians. So for those who have yet to be a member, please do check us out and join us as a member. During, during our recent survey among our members, politics in Malaysia ranked as one of the most sought after areas of interest. So when the Sabah election was announced, we felt it was the right moment to have a talk on Sabah election. So please allow me to thank Dr. Bridget Walsh and Dr. Sri Wong Chun Wai to agree to become the speaker and moderator for this talk. When I was talking to Dr. Walsh for the date of this talk, as you know, the election was on September 26, which was on a Saturday. I had proposed the following Monday as a date for the talk. And she said, no, 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 she's too early. That's what she said. She said, you need to wait for the dust to settle. I, I think she was right because only yesterday we know, we know that who the chief minister is and then I don't know how many one had guessed that the number of chief, uh, deputy chief ministers we do have right now. So anyway, I'm sure that the Baja Sabah can afford it. Okay, what is going to happen now is I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Sri Wong, which honestly uh, doesn't need a lot of uh, introductions. Anyway, I still need to do the job. <laughs> Dr. Sri Cha is, Wong is the currently group advisor of the Star Media Group. And he's best known for his time at the Star Media Group as Group MD and CEO for 20, to, from 2013 to 2018. He received his earlier education at Xavier's institutions in Penang and graduated from UKM, majoring in political science and history in 1984. He has received many awards locally and globally. He has interviewed world leaders, including US President Bill Clinton, and Boris Johnson. He's a very sought after speaker, and therefore we're very fortunate that we have him with us right now. So apart from being a moderator, I've also asked him to share his view on Malaysian politics. So I'm gonna not take so much time because I'm gonna leave it for uh, Dr. Welsh. The agenda for, this talk is, for today's talk is, Dr. Welsh is gonna start uh, her view, and thereafter I'm gonna invite uh, Dr. Sri Wong to share his, and please do send in your questions that you have uh, so that uh, our moderator, Dr. Sri Wong, could take and pose it to uh, Dr. Welsh. We have a hard stop at five for today's because <clears throat> although our, our, our event is scheduled to end at 4.30, but I'm just allowing some extra time just in case we have a lot of Q&A. Without further ado, over to you, Dr. Sri. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Just call me Chunoy. Okay. Um, Dr. Bridget Welsh needs no introduction to. I've been uh, following her articles and she has always been right on the dot. And that uh, she's not a, uh, one of those people who do coffee shop talk because her analysis are full of uh, proper methodologically done and that the analysis are actually very good and uh, more important, accurate. Now, Dr. Bridget Welsh, Welsh is an independent scholar and political analyst currently based in Kuala Lumpur. She is currently an honorary research associate with the University of Nottingham, Asia Research Institute of Malaysia. She is also a senior research associate of the Wufeng Center for East Asia Democratic Studies of National Taiwan University. 
and the Senior Associate Fellow of the Habibi Center. She specializes in Southeast Asian politics with a focus on Malaysia, Myanmar, Singapore, and Indonesia. An author and editor of numerous books, reports, and articles. Her last report is Grappling with Transition, Myanmar's 2019 Asia Barometer Findings. Her forthcoming book, A Divided Malaysia, the Rise and Fall of Pakatan Harapan examines Malaysia's 2018 elections and the transformation of national politics during the Harapan government. At the, uh, she also teaches at the, uh, she taught at the Singapore Management University and the Hofstra University. She received her PhD in political science from the prestigious Columbia University and a had language training at the Cornell University and a BA from Colgate University. She's a senior advisor for Freedom House, a member of the International Research Council of the National Endowment for Democracy, and a core member of the Asian Barometer Survey covering 15 countries in East Asia. More importantly, she has written many articles and books on Malaysian politics, including Sabah politics. And of course, recently, she wrote an excellent article on why Warisan plus lost in Malaysia Kini. We are indeed privileged and honored to have her here to share with us her findings. Now, uh, before that, let me do a recap of what has happened in Sabah and at, during the elections. As a recap, the elections saw 443 candidates from 17 parties that does not include the independents contesting for 73 seats. Now, and this is an interesting fact. Of the 19 state assemblymen who had jumped or became frogs in the, uh, since the 2018 general election, 12 of these frogs actually got re-elected this time. Okay, no. One candidate who is facing criminal charges has become a deputy chief minister. Sabahans, who were against political frogs, had also paradoxically prayed for PBS to join Warisan to become frogs after the election. So you can see that it is Sabah demo crazy, okay, at work. Now, we pass the mic to uh, Dr. Vers to share your findings and analysis with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with all of you today. And I'm trying to see if I can get the, um, my shared things on, but I still see. Okay, here we go. Um, so I'm going to speak to you about what's happening, what happened in Sabah, and what I see as sort of the macro things that are moving forward. And I am now trying to share my slides as we do this, um, as I have a presentation for you. And this is causing a tiny bit of a challenge. Um, okay, one moment. Okay, this is actually, here we go. Okay, this is how we are. Almost done here, sorry. Logistical issues, sharing. All right, so I think you should be seeing my slides at this point, am I correct? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for your patience. So what I'd like to do is I've present, prepared about 14 slides that I wanna go through some of the complexities of Sabah politics, but also talk about the bigger picture. Um, so let's start with um, uh, what I see is actually um, happening in the context of Saba. What we see, um, <clears throat> and, and I'm going to lay out what the scene for the election was, what sort of happened during the campaign, who were successful, and also what are the kind of implications for Malaysia more broadly. Let's talk a little bit about the national scene just as it starts. We have a government uh, led by Muhyiddin Yassin, who has what I would call weak legitimacy. Um, he doesn't have, he came into power, uh, what people in Malaysia call the back door, but at the same time uh, is part of a process of coalition politics. Um, and, he, and this election was very important in that it was about helping him to try to build his legitimacy. We also see a situation where all the political parties across Malaysia have become weakened. They've become highly personalized. 
Uh, and there is, uh, the focus is very much at the elite level, not necessarily in terms of representing people uh, in terms of what people voted for in GE, GE 14 in 2018. And so this elite kind of fragmentation uh, is also featuring in the political process as we move forward uh, and as, we, as it came into the election. We also have a politically polarized electorate. This is also true in the case of Sabat, which we'll see in a few moments, but it is particularly uh, pronounced in, this, in the peninsula. We have a situation in Malaysia of coalition government formation. And to keep this in mind, uh, this, is some, this is something fundamentally different than we've had in the past, where, election, where coalitions were formed before elections. Now we have a situation where coalitions are formed and are reforming. They may be reforming as we are speaking in that process. Uh, we also see a situation where we have a different type of electorate. We have uh, a, a, it varies by class and by education level, but we also see much more demanding electorate. But in the last two years, one that is becoming, especially with those that are very pro-reform oriented, much more cynical. We see a situation in the national scene of a very difficult environment for the economy, widening inequalities. And of course, this is very much connected to COVID-19 which was a very important factor in some election, contributed in part, but, but as a major factor to a drop in the turnout levels. We have a large young electorate in the context of Malaysia. We're looking at about 40 to 45% of the electorate under the age of 40. Uh, and in the context of Sabah, it was only about 25% of the electorate, but it was still a very large share, 25% uh, under the age of 30, 45% uh, under the age of 40. So it is, a, it is a dry, elections become competitive. New, new forces, new actors come in in this process. And of course, we see a situation of political instability. And to keep this in mind, we are in a situation in Malaysia, we've had three different governments in, three, in two years. And this is unprecedented for the context of Malaysian history. And of course, it raises a lot of attention to political issues because there's constantly people asking what's next, but also there's other people that saying, please no more, we're tired of this. We, we have a lot of fatigue in this process. Uh, and so we will see how this, uh, this is the kind of sense of the context of the national level. Now, Saba, as many of you in the audience probably know these things, uh, I'm gonna be very brief to kind of lay out the kind of context here. But in July of this year, we saw a situation where the sub previous Saba government that was elected um, and that was put in power in May, 2018 fell. Keep in mind that that government was actually also a coalition government that formed. So in 2018 in Sabah, there were actually no clear victories. Both sides won an equal amount of seats. And initially at the time, Musa Aman formed a coalition government with some people who jumped to his side. And then subsequently with jumpers on the, on the and frogging, uh, uh, Warasan, uh, Warasan Plus or Warasan not at the Allies at that point, led by Shafi Abdel, formed the government. So in fact, we saw a polarized situation, but one that involved coalition formation. And in particular, what is important to understand is that one of the traditional BN parties, UPCO, which is led, part of the representing seats in the Karazan Dusun Murad area, was a pivotal, pivotal actor that moved to Warasan to give it its majority and form the government. And of course, this has been subsequently tested in courts and others. But what happened in July is Musa Aman struck back, managed to get more defectors, and to be able to challenge uh, Shafi. And he, he had the numbers. And, what ha and instead of going for allowing Musa Aman to take over the government, we saw a situation where they, the governor, uh, if Sabah decided, uh, listen to what Shafi Abdel had requested, which is to seek elections. That set the context for the elections. They were held from September 12th to the 26th of this, this month. Uh, uh, and we see a situation where uh, it was a context of, uh, there was a sense of real wanting to, to affect uh, the Sabah polls not only involved Sabah, it involved the issue of what type of alliances are gonna form in coalition governments, who is going to lead the country, and of course, what will be the timing of national elections. And of course, I think in some ways, one of the conclusions I will try to make depending on time is that 
COVID-19 in the Sabah election campaign is contributing to keeping the elections a little bit down the road uh, at, at this particular juncture. But we'll come to some of those issues a little bit later. Mm -hmm. So we saw two sides, uh, Shafi Abdel uh, led by uh, led Waris and Plus, uh, uh, and he was the government at, the, at that time. Yeah? Uh, and we will see that he, his government was very much targeted. I would say this was arguably uh, in the Sabah's history, and there are many elections that were extremely important in Sabah, but I would say comparatively, this one received the most resources and most federal attention uh, as they tried to uh, change and take over the government, which they were successful in doing. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Sri has been very, uh, has laid out some of the issues in terms of the uh, election, uh, 73 seats. Uh, there were 13 of these that were new. Interestingly, of these 13 new seats, uh, the Warasan Plus only won four of them out of the nine, out of the 13, which I think is something that uh, did not work in their favor. Seats in Malaysia, as they are, as you know, are malapportioned. So you have some seats that have 30,000 voters and some seats that have 5,000 voters. Uh, this, of course, makes a big difference in the context of, uh, of, of representation, especially particularly of certain communities that live in urban areas, and particularly, I would suggest, Chinese Sabahan. Huh? Uh, we see a very different, uh, 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 the seats are organized around ethnic configurations and geographic space. So, and most of these seats, unlike even arguably the rest of the peninsula, but somewhat like Sarawak, 74% of these seats are very, are semi-rural or even, uh, or even I would argue very remote. That means it's very difficult to access. You need to have machinery to get there. Uh, and it is a different type of campaign when you're in a rural area than you are in an urban area. We saw new alliances sort of form around the election. We had Perakita National, led by Muhyiddin Yassin, comprised at that time of predominantly of his party, Bursatu, uh, uh, allied with the uh, States' Rights Party of Jeffrey Kitting and Starr, also with SAC, SAPP by Yong Ket Lee, who I think will be a very prominent person in the next uh, state government um, in, in Sabah. Mm -hmm. Uh, allied with the M, um, which uh, we had to be an A, MCA, uh, and, P and separately, of course, running separately, but a part of what would become this GRS alliance, we had uh, uh, the Ketazan Party based party, uh, PBS. These major parties, which were PN, BN, PCS, and STAR, uh, were actually versus Warasan. Warasan was comprised of Warasan originally, DAP, who decided to take the Warasan logo, PKR, and UPCO. As I mentioned earlier, there were 391 candidates uh, from 14 parties, uh, of which 56 were independent. About seven of those had chances, three of which actually won. One of them, a few, one of them, one of the smaller parties lost by simple like 84 votes. So we'll come to that in a few moments about the contest. Now, to understand Sabah, you have to appreciate that it is an extremely competitive contest. It has been for many years. Sabah has a history of rich competitive elections that go back to the 1980s. And it is one of the few places in the context of, uh, of Malaysia where we've seen different changes of government uh, repetitively uh, over time. Uh, and this is something uh, that I think is quite unique to Sabah compared to many of the other states. It is also complex because the ethnic configuration in Sabah is not the same as it is in the rest of Malaysia. Uh, of course, Sarawak has its own unique formations as well, but the traditional MCIO, the Malays, Chinese, Indian, and other categories really have very little salience in the context of Sabah. You look at 42 different ethnic groups uh, with different local or, or suku identities. People talk about the issue of tribes, um, uh, but there is really different unique communities within communities uh, from a perspective as a political anthropologist. Uh, what we're looking at uh, in terms of the major groups are the KDM, which are the Ketazan, Dusun, and Murut. They actually are quite different and depending on where within themselves. But these are the three major groups that are often grouped together of indigenous communities from Sabah State. The Chinese, uh, and Chinese traditionally uh, have been always known as the kingmakers of Sabah politics. Uh, they have, their political power is still extremely important. Uh, but they have, uh, their population share has dropped uh, as the demographic of Sabah has changed, which I'll come to in a moment. You have Malays, which are uh, comprised of, uh, of Malays from Brunei, some from this peninsula that have moved over. Um, you have uh, Baja Suluk, which are people who come from largely from the, the uh, there are two different groups. There's the Baja Laut and Baja uh, 
Bajo Tana, which are the different groups of people who came into Sabah, but are also Sabahans and Suluk, many of which have origins from the Sulu parts of the Philippines. These are seen as the major groups. There are uh, other communities. To put this in context, the others comprise 30% of the electorate. And so it is a very complex ethnic configuration. The other thing to understand about Sabah is the sheer concentration of poverty. Sabah has the most poverty in Malaysia. One out of five households are poor. This means that they get an income of less than 2,200 uh, ringgit uh, per month. Um, uh, it, it, these, this poverty is all over, but it's concentrated in the interior. Um, and we see a situation where this becomes an advantage for those campaigning campaigns that have adequate resources uh, uh, to be able to address some of these issues and use finances, financing during the campaign. We see personalities and personal loyalties are extremely important because these are small contests. People know each other. It's not like Kuala Lumpur where you wouldn't know your, your YB uh, or your, your member of parliament. In, in Sabah, people know them and they're from families. And these become very important if they're accessible, if they're living in their areas, the local, the local communities. We also saw Sabah has had a, a significant economic downturn. Uh, particularly in areas of palm oil and tourism. Uh, we also see this, this spilled all over um, uh, to see how many buildings and, and, and were, were now empty and businesses closed. It was, it was really uh, a very worrying trend that is not only happening in Sabah, but happening nationally. We see a strong nationalist, state nationalist movement. And this is a state nationalist movement that, that has had two very different um, historical trajectories in the 19. At 80s and 90s under PBS, uh, pushing for the rights of the KDM communities. And later in the context of 2013 under Jeffrey Kittigan, pushing for a more kind of state autonomy around the, the famous Malaysia 63 agreement. And of course, it's now taken on a different character, which we'll come to perhaps if we have conversation later. But it is a very powerful movement to appreciate that the secessionist sentiment in Sabah is growing. When we did polling on this top topic earlier, well, originally uh, in about 10 years ago, maybe 5% of Sabahans would say that they were interested in leaving, that leaving, the, the, leaving Malaysia. That number went up to 25% and now it's over 50%, which is a very uh, shocking, but also very significant figure of the impact of, of state rights mobilization and, and the saliency of the federal state relationship vis-a-vis -vis Sabah. We also see in the polling, in the, in the voting patterns, that Sabahans swing. Uh, they swing, they like to swing and sing and everything else as good Sabahans would do, they enjoy life. But I'm talking about electorally. They swing in the sense that, they, that you see a lot of movement in how they vote. And that is, some, that is in some ways very important to understand um, in historical elections, but also as this election moves forward. Now, now we look at the show. We see two very different types of campaigning and different sets of messaging. Uh, on the left is a, is a Warsan Plus uh, poster using the issue of frogging. On the right is the centralized focus of, of the, the PNBN campaign of Muhyiddin Yassin, uh, which you can see phrases that are things like Kita Jaga Kita or Abba, I'm like my fa your father. All right, and, and these were coupled with other messaging forms, which we'll see in this kind of two very different dominant traditions. One that is a more modern campaign, one that was more traditional. And what we see is of the two campaigning styles that the traditional campaigning was more effective because it was combined with many different types of techniques than the modern campaigning, uh, which was adopted by Warasan. So what were the types of messaging in the campaign? Well, Warasan Plus used, as I mentioned, modern campaigning, uh, the uh, anger against the defections. But what was particularly salient, especially in the rest of Malaysia and internationally, was this kind of message of unity uh, on issues of race and religion. This was very powerful message uh, that, you know, that they said that we, that tried to build a sense of of community and not to you and to challenge the traditional kind of campaign narrative which has been to use divide and rule tactics on race and religion to kind of mobilize and this was a, a part you know you could see other posters that were used um, 
that showed Shafi in kind of Obama style and uh, talking about issues of uh, one nation and, and, and toler religious tolerance. Um, and at the same time, as the campaign evolved, the campaign increasingly for Warism Plus focused on the issue of state autonomy, saying, hey, wait a minute, we can survive without you. We should have our own independence and so forth. Muhyiddin Yassin and the, the group uh, UMNO, which was not necessarily uh, under the kind of broader GRS coalition, really focused heavily on COVID-19 administration and the, and the distribution of COVID-19 aid, the issues of the economy, uh, the issues of the need for federal power and resources, the questions associated with uh, security uh, and particularly security of individual livelihoods, and they were very, they were more effective um, uh, in tapping into issues of local loyalties because there was, they, there were a lot of independent candidates that, and, and, and smaller party candidates that helped to split the vote, some of which of that fund was funded from outside. So we see this kind of this strategic dimension of the way the campaign was, was I think, very uh, well oiled. You had a lot of uh, some federal officers coming in in the campaign. Um, in the sense, it was uh, supported not just by Sabahans, but by the federal machinery um, uh, compared to that of Warrison Plus. This is not to say that Warrison Plus did not, not use some of the game, the issues of resources and local loyalties on their own. They did. Money was, was thrown everywhere. But what I'm trying to say is that at the same time, we had a slight differences in terms of the, the kind of the multiple strategies that were used by the GRS versus the kind of a more, a little more static campaign by that of, of our son. In the local level, when you spoke to voters, as I did so many times in the course of the, uh, the month and a half that I was in and out of, in Sabah, I would say that, you know, what, especially during the campaign, uh, I felt that for many of the voters who were expressing confusion uh, about which is blue color you should vote for and what those flags were, a lot of ordinary people, uh, the message I spoke was was of what was familiar. And so when we look, for example, at the success of, the, of, uh, of Jeffrey Pyron's party and Max Onkeli's party, PBS, uh, um, and the, it, the success of UMNO, which was fielded uh, predominantly uh, in their seats, majority younger people, and it was based on the party brand, was people who voted for the familiar. And, uh, and even Perikada National used the same blue colors, the same kind of messaging colors to kind of remind people that they were the BN in the, uh, or connected to the BN. Uh, and that was also feeding into this familiarity. And part of that has to do with the reality that people are living in a situation of insecurity and, and that insecure, and, and there's also confusion as well as a sense that the fundamentally the, the votes that the, they're not sure who to connect to. And so they'd rather go with what they know as opposed to uh, what they don't know uh, and, or are uncomfortable with. Uh, and we'll come to that in a few moments. Now, as the campaign evolved, there were critical things that really were decisive. One, of course, was the role of money. Now, many people from outside think that this is all about an election being bought. And I think that there are issues that have to do with this the aspect of voter voter. Uh, vote buying. And yes, there were considerable money given in some constituencies. And I'm talking considerable money would be something like 900 ringgit, uh, which, is, which, is, uh, which is more than the minimum wage uh, uh, in this area. Uh, but at the same time, there were other parts of the campaign in Sabah where no money was actually thrown. But money matters not as much for vote buying because many people take the vote and, and choose otherwise, but more in terms of being able to oil the machinery and in particular to turn out the vote in these remote rural seats where you need to bring people to the polls. And, and this idea of Dwit Tambang, of bringing in these costs, someone has explained it to me, you know, almost 75% of, of costs in some seats is just about caring and fearing voters that in this process because they can't afford to get there on their own. They don't have the means, the cars, the transportation, you provide that. And on election day, you could see where the oil machines were very well oiled. You had fairing of uh, voters. You could have, they paid for the cost of the votes. And in fact, uh, part of the tactics in many of these seats is to buy out all the vans so that you actually control the, the transportation process. So, and then you have to, others have to buy others. So it's quite, quite an interesting dynamic. Machinery also is a traditional part of the campaign. And as I was suggesting to you, that one of the things that gave, that pipped 
uh, Barca National and Proyecto National was the issue of uh, machinery, which which was especially effective uh, for because uh, um, it was supported compared to some of the Wars and Plus parties, in particular, UPCO had some machinery problems. In the very beginning of the campaign, there was intensive sabotage, especially within Perks and National Team, unsatisfaction. Keep in mind that 17 of the 73 seats that many of the GRS partners competed against each other. By the way, of those, only one that they lost. So uh, in fact, it didn't necessarily make a difference in their overall outcome. But what was interesting about the sabotage is that it also happened within the Wars and Plus Team as well. And there was infiltration of the wire sun plus side people plus side. So many some voters would describe this to me like this. They said, I'm not going to vote for wire sun, but I've put out the wire sun flag so, and so that they leave me alone. Uh, and it was very interesting to sort of say, and you know, so when people wore shirts like this young man who I have who was wearing a shirt in one of the seats in the West Coast from the past, he put on a shirt, he explained to me. I'm wearing this shirt so I can get an offer of money, but I'm not sure who I'm going to vote for. And I said, but this is the shirt of the last election. Oh, yes, but I'm putting myself uh, uh, to, uh, uh, clearly uh, uh, right ahead right now so I can begin to, see, to show, to make things on offer. You know, voters are very smart, but they also cannot necessarily be read just by what they're wearing or how they're acting. And I think there is a lot of pragmatism in Sabah, which is one of the things that comes out in the way people were voting. <laughs> We saw in the course of the campaign, there were shifts in messaging. So we saw, for example, Warrison Plus moved away from this message of unity that really got so many people excited, uh, especially liberals from the Simanunjung side of the country, huh? um, and, and to a kind of, kind of state uh, autonomy message. Uh, and that started to talk about federal interference and people like the former Chief Justice, uh, Richard Muldoon, Muldoon, came in and spoke about this. So you started to see a sort of shifting momentum uh, in terms of the types of messaging. But, uh, and in the case of BN uh, and PN, their momentum became a slightly different momentum. So they kept their message consistent on the outside, but most of their campaigning was taking place behind the scenes. And what they did very successfully is to reduce their internal sabotage and to bring people down, such for example, Musa Aman went to those areas where he was in places like Gum Gum and Sunni Sabunga, and so, and, which are seats on the, the north, uh, west, northeast coast, uh, traditionally his seat and seats around them. And, and he made a difference in, the, in at least two of those seats by coming and sort of appeasing the ground in very cynic ways. And this was a very, done in a very calculated, very targeted manner um, as things move. And of course, also one of the key issues in the campaign, which I had not written down here, is of course the comments of uh, uh, Mohammed in Katapi, which affected the early voting. And of course, if we look at the seats uh, of the 19 seats, we can see disproportionately at least uh, that this had a big impact um, in at least, at least 10 of the seats in terms of swinging in the margins uh, in, in a particular ways, negatively for Warasan. So it was a very, these were factors that kept in the momentum of the campaign. Not to be left out of the equation was the importance of Anwar's announcement, which of course uh, led to a uh, kind of distraction away from Sabah and particularly away from Shafi. The campaign issues, uh, I'm seeing I'm getting close to time, so I'm gonna just speed up a tiny bit, but let me just sort of Sort of lay it out. Uh, uh, I have only more four more slides, so I think I still have enough time. But one is the sense of illegal immigration. Uh, I think few people understand there. Are, you know, officially there's 600,000. Some people, uh, others, the UN will put it at higher. Um, uh, official, unofficial numbers can go up to 1.2 million illegal immigrants in Sabah. And some of them have legal documents. Some of them don't. Uh, some of them are documents that we think are legal, we don't know are legal, um, but the reality is is that this is something that is very deeply sensitive to the KDM communities and to other parts of other Sabahans who have felt since the 1980s that the demographic shift uh, has been one that has been bringing in outsiders into the state. And this uh, issue was not addressed by the, the Warasan government. Uh, and Shafi uh, Abdel is seen from that area, and his party was portrayed as a PTI party. And this was clear all over social media, on the, uh, particularly in the last, uh, last year, uh, but especially after the Kamanis by-election in January of this year. 
and that created an image problem for Warasan Plus parties in the KDM communities. Economic livelihoods, the issues of development, uh, you know, you're lucky in, in at least I would say half of the state if you find a good internet signal. I'm just telling you, and this is a conservative estimate, but we're talking about, you know, roads, the, the level of poverty and the level of lack of infrastructure is not fitting of what Malaysia ideals should be. And we can see this uh, explicitly. I have a picture here on the left uh, of, you know, these are stateless children in the northern part of Sabah. And, you know, they come, they are part of a, a, a illegal syndicate. Uh, you know, they come and try to raise money and, and that none of them have any documents. They don't go to school. This is just a typical example of what you can see uh, of what ordinary people face on the ground. Another important issue was Warasan's incumbency. Warasan had a real challenge in the sense that uh, it, had, it, was, it was a short incumbency, so it didn't have a lot of time to make deliverables, and it had what I call and have been calling the Pakistan Harapan problem, and that is that there's no, uh, no sense of reform, there was no sense of, uh, of economic deliverables, and the successes that they did have, they, which were quite a few, uh, uh, actually did not necessarily translate and were communicated effectively. And so this, of course, meant that the kind of sentiment, uh, and I, the phrase I, off, I, that sticks in my mind, it was explained to me by an illegal immigrant who had been in Sabah for 40 years. Uh, he says, we took a salada, salada, which means that I'm changing my appetite, I'm changing my taste. Uh, uh, and it was a very interesting type of reference. We also have a dynamic that few people outside of Sabah fully understand, is that between the east coast of Sabah, which is where uh, a lot of the PTI communities have been, and the east coast of, and the west coast of Sabah. And there is a sense that the threat, the invasions, and everything else come from the east. And of course, Warasan's political base is in the east. So this sort of has a subtext, particularly in some parts of the KDM community. And of course, as I discussed earlier, we also have the issues of state rights, which involve not just involve not just the issues of resources and financing, but religious freedom and also autonomy over the making decisions within the state itself. It's a very there are many complex dimensions to this, not just in the MA63 agreement, but more broadly within the sense of where Sabah uh, should be controlling and uh, its own destiny uh, in terms of its uh, its heritage, but also um, its culture. Now, what do we see in terms of the results? Well, many of you are aware that uh, the bigger picture is that that Warasan, um, that DRS won 38 seats. You needed 37 to form a government. Three independents won, so that means that they had, and all of these independents were former BN members. And so they are, they aligned with um, uh, with the GRS. Huh? Uh, and Warasan Plus, 132. Uh, they, of that composition, in particular, DAP did very well, uh, winning six out of seven of their seats. Warasan performed one a few more seats than last time, but they contested it more. Uh, so, uh, in fact, actually, their support level went down somewhat. And uh, what we saw is in the, in the, the, the results for the GRS, we saw that uh, PN won um, uh, that you saw a situation where uh, Amno uh, won 14 seats. They became the biggest party of the GRS, followed by Versato at 11, followed by PBS, which did very well in the KDM communities, winning seven, and as well as uh, Star winning five seats and sort of positioning itself in this process. Richard, now, yeah. Richard if you, I yeah. do want to interrupt. Um, can you turn your screen to slideshow because uh, the numbers look very small and oh, because I thought it, I think it, I thought it was on slideshow. Huh? Is this better? Oh, yes. is that better? Yeah. Oh, yes. Sorry, you guys. I, I apologize. This is where the numbers are very clear. You might, yeah. Yeah, so this is, well, now you can see. Um, I will quickly give you a sense of what was on the other slide so you can see how beautiful the photos were. All right, and then we'll come back. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Since you, those of us, I'm older, I would have been complaining earlier with not being able to see. But here we are uh, uh, on this context. So look at the difference between the, the popular vote. 
318,531 versus 316,049, a difference of eight of less than 2,000, uh, um, a little bit over 2,000 votes, <laughs> a very small share. All right, and this difference is in the overall popular vote. <laughs> Uh, the independents did extremely well. Uh, and if we can see these numbers more carefully, um, if we look specifically at the percentages, which are on this column over here, 43.5% versus 43.2% in the top row vote, and 13.6% in terms of independents winning. It is a very, very Bridget, you need to unmute yourself. You have mute yourself. I, just ah, the picture. I do yeah. the picture so I could show you the numbers. Uh, but this is better. So now what we see is that some of these things that are quite interesting in terms of the results is, is you know, how the weight of the seats, uh, the, popular, the popular vote looks like it goes heavily for Warrison because many of these also seats were in the urban areas. But we can see very interesting sort of configuration and shifts. Huh? In the, in the results, which I'm going to come to in a few moments. So I did an initial preliminary analysis of all the 73 seats. This was uh, in the in a Malaysia Kini article, which you're welcome to take a look at. Um, and I look at this from an ethnic perspective, but I also have done a few other analyses, which I will complement in the conversation since then. But if we can see, for example, uh, the first thing to understand is that voter turnout dropped. 11% in this election, from 77% to 66%. It's a huge drop, not a small amount. The main factor of that was COVID-19. And a lot of people didn't come home. I, could, I know of at least personally 10 people who told me they canceled their ticket because they didn't want to be in quarantine. Yes, quarantine, self-quarantine. Uh, so we see a situation. Right? where they, uh, they didn't, uh, this is a reality of the, the dynamics. <laughs> uh, we see turnouts drop, particularly among Chinese, uh, um, but not only among that. Uh, we saw differences across the board uh, as a product of uh, the shift in, in the nature of the election. You have to understand that for some of these voters, say, for example, Chinese voters, it wasn't just about COVID-19. It was also that they just didn't, were not happy, so they chose not to come out. The incumbency factor was there. There was a degree of disappointment among some of the voters. And I think it's useful to look at that in the context of the Bajau community. But also, a lot of it was focused on the realities of the fact that many times Warrison Plus did not spend the money to, to pool its electorate because of the weaker machinery. So these are the things that contributed. Um, now we look at the support by, by the different uh, major support actors, GRS, Warrison Plus, and others. And what we see really interesting differences uh, and changes from GE14. And again, because of time constraints, I'm not going to go into all of them, but I'll just pull out a few that I think are interesting for you. The first of which is that um, among the KDM community, there was no change. The KDM stayed with the BN, PN. They, they just stayed, they, they didn't move. <laughs> So Warasan didn't address the PTI issue and didn't pull them along. And UPCO, which was the, the partner that was contesting in 12 of the seats, they only won one. Um, and the UPCO was the same party that left to join, the, uh, join and form Warasan government in 2018. They got punished for in this, in this reality. We saw, interestingly, how among, Waris, among Chinese supporters, huh, while some, many of them stayed home, those that did vote voted strongly for Warsaw. They connected into the message. And some of that was about the idea of unity and about representation, but some of that also was the fact that they were very uncomfortable with having a potential Bung um, uh, and Umno as a chief minister <laughs> uh, from an economic perspective. <laughs> uh, and he was in the running at, the, at that point of time. So there were different issues. Predominantly, this is not a change from GE14 that is significant. In fact, it was just a small increase. And it's quite different than what we see what's happening with the Chinese support on the peninsula. We also see changes in particular among the, the Bajau, which is the Bajau Sulu. This is the 
ethnic base of, uh, of uh, Shafi and we saw drops in support among other communities as well, uh, particularly in the other community was the community of the Bugis that are concentrated along, they find many of them along the East Coast. So there were shifts in this particular group. Now, in the remaining time that I have, uh, which I've already reached the point of reaching the time limit, I'm going to speak about what I see are the two sets of scenarios, the kind of so what. Huh? We see a situation of a polarized electorate, we see a, a new uh, GRS victory, a victory for, supposedly for Muyadin, and we see a situation where, you know, kind of traditional forces have now, uh, you know, beating out more modern reform oriented uh, governance. These are the things, that the messages that are seen to be taken from uh, at the back. Well, in terms of Sabah, we have a situation where the GRS is now uh, in power. There are four major political parties. Hajiji Noor is the CM. Uh, he is uh, a, a seasoned administrator, been in power, been in government in politics since 1990. He, um, he's, a, he's very well liked. He seemed very measured. Uh, he is a customs officer. He, he's seen as uh, someone who can helm the ship uh, in that process. He, and all of the other major parties have been given DCM ships. Uh, we're seeing all of the cabinet being negotiated and announced, and, and it's not quite out yet, but it's coming. <laughs> Uh, the problem is, is that these four parties compete against each other. PBS competes against Star, BN competes against Omno. There are sources of instability or a lack of stability within that. There are also very strong personalities. And I think we've already seen that's come to the fore. It's going to be difficult, interesting to see whether or not there's a working relationship. Do I see this new GRS government offering a new vision for Sabah? No, I don't. I don't see uh, a situation of fundamentally addressing the sets of problems that were in place uh, from the perspective at the state level. It will, if it does happen, it will take the need for, for cooperation at the federal level. And I think this is where there is going to be some challenge on the part of PBS and Jeffrey, and Jeffrey Starr to have some sort of deliverables in terms of some of the issues in terms of state rights. But this has become, at the, from the state-federal relationship, a source of tension. Uh, will some of these development challenges be addressed? I think now that the Sabah election is over, I think the reality is, is that Sabah is not necessarily going to get the same level of tension. What is striking is how few development projects were promised during the campaign. I have a list of eight. <laughs> All right, this is not typical because this is a reality that there's less money to spend, right? And, let, and from the perspective of the government, so there's so they used instead the issue of uh, local aid as the uh, uh, cash transfer aids uh, aid as their as their motive at modus operandi as opposed to projects. We will see. Um, even the Bourne area, North Borneo Highway is taking a long time in for Sabahan. So I am not optimistic in terms of changing the model of governance uh, in a more fundamental way. Um, but I do think that uh, what we're seeing is a situation where uh, uh, we do have a seasoned hand at the helm. And I, and I do feel that, uh, that there will be at least seen to be some projects for the business community, but not necessarily addressing the fundamental issues of poverty and issues of development that Saba is facing. Now, what does all of this mean for the national stage? These are the questions that most of you are interested in. Well, what we're seeing in Malaysia right now, as I laid out earlier in this period of polarized situations and realities, is that the state dynamics and the federal dynamics are intertwined. And what happened in Sabah is now affecting the national picture. And even as we speak, people are negotiating and discussing whether or not there will be a new partnership in terms of new relations. And whether or not that comes through, or whether or not that's all talk, is something we're going to see as things evolve. But as I look forward, there are broadly three sets of scenarios that one can speak to. One is a Muyadin Yassin government continuing to hold the helm and managing to stay in power. This is a scenario that I think uh, is preferred by certain interests in Malaysia in the sense that they want stability, they want a, uh, a situation where they can have some normalcy, uh, that Buyudin Yassin himself remains quite popular by all indicators of surveys, 
Uh, and the fact is, is that uh, the business community in particular is interested in having a sense of stability. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that inside the status quo is in particular Omno, who is not, uh, not comfortable with this reality position that they have now, which is that they're no longer the hegemonic party in the country. And the results in Sabah show that. And so there are different groups and different factions within Amno who would like the status quo to go. Uh, Bursato has two groups, major groups. Uh, Amno has two major groups. And these create a sense of fluidity in these processes. Is the status quo possible? Yes. Um, we did, did get some gains. Uh, the people would like elections to go down the line, especially in terms of the impact of COVID and others. Uh, but I think also there's a lot of pressure so we can give it a 30% chance. <laughs> then we move to the next time, next scenario, which is a new government. Lots of talk by Anwar Ibrahim, which I think at, this, at that point was perceived to be having the numbers, whether or not those, truth, those numbers uh, were truthful at that time, history will show that. We will see whether or not the issues in terms of uh, fluidity, in terms of new announcements are made. Um, but I think that in the context of new government, one has to understand that there's competition for leadership now. There, uh, Shafi Abdel may have lost the election, but he's become a national contender. Uh, Anwar Ibrahim is, a, is still in the running. Um, and of course, do not forget that Tun Mahathir still thinks he's in the running. And so we see a situation where uh, these actors play an important role in sort of making a lot, new sets of alliances and, new, and, and splitting in others. And sometimes they lead and sometimes they're played. And the fact of the matter is, is can a new government emerge? Yes, but it will be one that will be a very different type of alliance. Keep, an under, keep in mind that Pakatan Harapan as an alliance in some ways doesn't exist quite the way it did before. And it is in some ways going to be strained. Uh, uh, and in particular of all the parties within it, the, I think the Democratic Action Party will be faced with a very difficult choice of how it will move or not move. In the case of uh, the alliances of GRS, Piketty Parker National and others, the party to look at is what PAS does. PAS stays or does it go? Because PAS is very important in determining what sort of alliances and how the direction moves forward. And of course, there's uh, Amno thinks that they're in charge, but they're actually not in charge because they're divided. And, the, and so PAS and, and, P, and DAP, representing the two poles of Malaysian politics, determine the configurations of what type of alliances can form and, and, and what type of government can be formed and how. Within that, we can see two very important dimensions about new government. The reform agenda is no longer as salient as it was. And I'm being that, and I think I'm saying that nicely and diplomatically. I said the second scenario is that we're seeing the representation of ethnic communities is also facing serious challenges as things move forward. And the leaders themselves are being challenged in terms of their credibility vis-a-vis -vis the relationship with the, the electorate. There is a big shift that is taking place. Is a new government possible? Yes, I give it 30%. And what I see is a situation where uh, a dynamic emerges that we have uh, a, a new sense of configurations and alliances. And that is very much likely in a coalition situation. The final scenario is that of elections. I give this one 35%, but I give it, I give a waiting period for it because of COVID-19 and the second wave coming. There may be something in a holding pattern in that process. But the reality is that the, the differences within different parties are pushing towards a new mandate. And many people in that mandate now think that they can win, especially UMNO. And they are driving some of this towards an, an election. Uh, but can it, can it happen soon? I think probably not till next year, any realistic things given COVID-19. But the fact of the matter is that there are others who would like it to hold on. And if there's a new government or the status quo, they'll push elections down the line. So what does this mean for ordinary Malaysians? when they're sitting to themselves and looking at Sabah and all this kind of noise that's coming from the state that they don't understand, but a beautiful, majestic state that deserves much, so much more. Well, well, the question is because people are tired of politics 
They're tired of uh, the situation. They're tired of the fact that policies are not addressing the problems that they're facing, especially at one of the most testing times the country has ever faced in terms of the economy, in terms of what's happening in COVID-19. Uh, the government policies, with all due respect to many of those who are doing, who are trying their best in government, are in denial of what is happening in the world uh, in this context of these sets of issues. And behind that become these issues of racialized politics that, be, that get to be used. Now, the good, there are silver linings that came out of Sabah. We see a move away from racial politics because the reality is to make a sense of unity. And we see a situation where um, there is a recognition that you're going to have to compromise and move forward. But whether or not people can actually do that um, in a very meaningful way past some of their old personalities is problematic. Where do I look for change in Malaysia? I see a lot of possibilities that are emerging as this changing relationship that society is having with politics. In Sabah, we didn't see this as much. Young movements, we see civil society actor, actors, we see a situation of a youth movement, but Sabah became a training ground for many of them. So I think we're gonna see new political forces. We already see them at the national stage starting to emerge and they're going to emerge forward. But it will be a very challenging time as Malaysia's democracy transforms in a way that many people feel is not necessarily what they thought it would be. Again, thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you, Dr. Welsh. It's always most interesting to hear. And I think um, we have a lot to digest. I'm going to um, invite Dr. Si Wong to moderate and uh, please, if you have any questions, uh, feel free uh, to, to send it in. And for those in Facebook, you can also send it in and we can also pick it up uh, from our end here as well. Uh, John White, please, thank you. Now, uh, while we're waiting for questions, I don't see any so far, I'll give my two cents to support the, what the Bridget has said. I think she has said it quite correctly. And just to recap uh, some of the things uh, and to expand a bit, uh, it is important to note that the uh, Kadazan Do Sun Murut group, which makes up something like 50, um, 26 to 60 percent of them, they voted for uh, the Gabungan JRS instead of Warisan Plus. And I think that it's important for uh, followers of this program, especially those in Semenanjung, especially Malaysians staying outside uh, Malaysia, including people from Hong Kong. They need to understand that uh, the Kadazan, the Dusan community, are really very uptight about the uh, illegal immigrant issue. It's very emotional, uh, which was why that uh, Warisan told uh, Dr. Mahathir not to come because basically the Kadazans and the Sabahans blame Dr. Mahathir for this scenario. They call it Project M. This instant uh, provision of uh, citizenship to foreigners, true or not, but there is a per perception over that, and that is very emotional over that. So uh, when UPCO decided to work with uh, Warisan, they were heavily punished. In fact, the UPCO president was defeated. And that uh, in Sabah, you are either an original Sabahan or a photocopy Sabahan. If you're a photocopy Sabahan, it means you're a foreigner. And I think that the, um, uh, the Barasan National and the GRS play up this issue quite cleverly in making the uh, impression that Shafi'i, who comes from Sampurna, in that area, they have a lot of foreigners and that he was sympathetic towards them. So when the people in Manjong and even Hong Kong, they ask this question that would it be able for PBS or STAR to work with uh, Warisan to form a new alternative, it would not be possible because that's how strong the sentiment is. And that um, the other issue which was brought up by uh, uh, Bridget is that um, the question of uh, reimbursement, okay? I do not see it as uh, money politics because the amount is actually very small. Okay, now you need to understand that unlike in KL or in Semenanjung, where a voter will just take a taxi or drive to the voting center themselves to vote, it doesn't happen in rural Sabah. It means leaving your daily wage. We're talking not talking about salary. You actually leave your job in the plantation. You have to travel for for a long journey by boat, by road, leave your family, and that. It costs a lot to, to actually go to vote. Now, when a candidate gives you that reimbursement or duit tambang, it means a lot to him because you're not, you're not going to tell him about uh, 
democracy, liberties, and social rights because for him, it's about earning his living. And what do I get out of it? If I vote for a certain YB, and I think they're all the same, it makes no difference, they will just disappear after the election. Now, in a rural area, the uh, politics of patronage is very important because they really rely on these uh, strong personalities for financial assistance and for credit facilities. I give an example, this place called Bangi, B-A-N-G-G-I, not B-A-N-G-I. That's the furthest tip of Malaysia. If you cross the island, you're in Philippines. And then people cannot imagine what it's like to be there. I went over to that place and I was like, wow, I actually saw people uh, because of the hot weather now there and because of uh, being informed, actually dressed like thousand on trees, okay? People in Smananjo cannot imagine that, okay? We are talking about people living in areas where they don't have ice box. They eat fresh fish, but they cannot keep it. And these are very rural areas, very poor people, where I actually saw people who keep chickens in their house, okay? Now, these are the kind of people who really need a lot of uh, financial patronage from the uh, from politicians now. Uh, Bridget has rightly talked about strong per personalities and uh, local personalities who matters a lot uh, in this uh, election and previous election. That's why people in Smananjo, we may have our uh, grievances with uh, Bo Mukta, very crude, okay, and that, uh, but he gets elected, okay, and uh, he's accessible over there. They look at him differently. So uh, that's my two cents worth at this point. Um, Lawrence, perhaps we have a question. Your Hong Kong Malaysians are very shy. Her question was, can Anwar make it to Putrajaya this time round? But I think, please, we want a very clear answer. I think that's that for, uh, uh, Is that a question for Bridget or for myself? For Bridget. For Bridget, and then maybe you can add later on. I'll let Dr. Sri go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I wrote an article last Sunday about and which I use the word Bahasa Malaysia word for meluat, which is basically I'm fed up and frustrated. And I think a lot of Malaysians share that uh, sentiments where, uh, what difference does it make uh, that uh, who, was, who was become prime minister or who should be prime minister, whether it's a front door, revolving door or what, it doesn't make any difference to me because as a Malaysian worker, and I can say that for a Malaysian worker, they are afraid of losing their job. They are afraid of being shown the door by their employers. So they don't care about these politicians, okay? And that and what is the economy program? How do you want to bring Malaysia forward? Is your only hope is just want to be prime minister or retain being prime minister? So Malaysians are just basically sick. Okay. The question is, does Arno has the numbers? Okay. As they say, show me the money. Okay. We have gone through this before. I think we went through this in 2008, right? In September 16. I wrote the article on Sunday and now and I had feedback to say that look, you know why uh, you have made many people unhappy with your blunt comments. But I'm gonna say that, that um, it is very unlikely. It is very unlikely that even if he has the numbers, okay, which I don't think so, even if he has the numbers, it is very unlikely that the king will grant him an audience. The king do not need to grant him an audience or to anyone. The king did not grant an audience to Dr. Mahathir, although he also claimed he had the numbers a day after the election. And I think that uh, nothing will happen until in parliament. If you have the numbers, show your numbers, put a motion of no confidence against Bohide and prove it. That's what's going to happen. That's my two cents. I think there are a few things I'd like to unpack here, which I think are... Uh, uh, so one is the issue of Anwar's credibility vis-a-vis -vis the numbers game. He's now faced it four times. And I think in last week's announcement, I think he's raised the stakes for himself in a very interesting way. If he is not able to deliver, this will actually really undermine him, I think. It's a little bit different than the previous times. So I think there's the question of credibility. Then the second issue analytically that I see is the question of legitimacy. Anwar has done, uh, has become the leader of the opposition over time because he was seen as a reformer. He has a lot of people who really, really support him because of this agenda uh, in this context. And I think the, the, the issue becomes not just as, uh, as uh, Chun Wai has just said just now, numbers, but also who are you connected with? 
all right, whether or not who do you ally with. If you end up allying with UMNO, which have been your traditional political enemy, it really faces an issue of legitimacy among your core supporters. And many of those, have, you have to understand, have a disproportionate ethnic composition from non-Malays. They have a disproportionate uh, 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 class orientation, upper middle class, middle class voters. <laughs> and also uh, they are concentrated in many parts, in particular parts of the more uh, western coast of Malaysia. So this issue of legitimacy is also something that I think is, 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 is particularly a challenge that Anwar has. And the argument that is being made is, okay, just get me into office, I'll be able to deliver. But they, but they look at the Mahathir government of Pakatan Harapan and say, hey, wait a minute, you said the same thing here. So there is a lot more cynicism, not just fed up in things, but I would say a sense of questioning that is happening. So it's numbers and composition. And then the third question becomes the issue of the nature of the political system and how it's evolving in terms of these fluidities and others. The real irony is that most of these politicians have come into office by making and helping to create the polarization of Malaysia society. And that polarization is really curtailing the ability for, or, uh, for people, to, for any unity government that might emerge to actually have support. Uh, and so because all of these leaders, Anwar included, are affected by these issues of polarization and credibility in, this, in, in very fundamental ways. And so when we ask this question of will Anwar become prime minister, you know, does he have a chance? Yes. I think that I agree that his chance is probably less than people think it is from the perspective. But we have to ask how it happens and at what cost does it happen in this way, in a very different sets of ways. If it comes through him allying himself with UMNO, he will have a very difficult problem when he faces the electorate, and he will eventually have to face the, face the electorate. And this perception that it is about him is now, is, is, as opposed to about the agenda, is something that has to be fundamentally addressed at, in as arenas move towards the sense of being accountable to the electorate. Uh, in this context. And I think, uh, you know, the reality from where I sit as a political analyst is that anybody who takes over a government at this time is taking on, I would always argue, a poison chalice, a situation of a very difficult economy, a very a, a situation of a very polarized electorate, uh, and, a, and a situation where uh, there is going to be inherent instability because of the fragmentation among the eight major parties that can shape the way the electorate can move at the national level. So to answer your question, we're not giving you, I'm giving you an explanation as opposed to a yes and no. I think that my own view is that Anwar is in a situation of diminished returns to become prime minister. Uh, as these processes continue to take on different sets of narratives in that area. But at the same time, I don't rule it out because the reality of fragmented politics uh, allows this to emerge. But I think that the gatekeeper of the king uh, is going to be very important in this process. And I, uh, I am not as emphatic as Chun, emphatic as, uh, emphatic as Chun Wai in saying that he'll never allow. Uh, but I would say that um, because I, the reason I, I'm not as uh, emphatic, I would have been taking that position a few months back. Uh, but I would say now, because of COVID-19, they're looking for a government that can be stable. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and there may be a movement, but whether or not that has attraction, I think, uh, and whether or not he will get that, I think it's very telling that the king is not accessible at this particular period of time. Uh, and you need to get to the gatekeeper. And then ultimately, you will need to have a mandate of your own, and there will be costs. If you, if you, if you, if you, the process of how you get into power. And I think the fact of the matter is um, both Anwar and Mahathir have diminishing returns as leaders in this process. And most Malaysians are looking for different leaders. This is why Shafi Abdel emerged so powerfully as a national figure. Uh, his messaging, he, you know, it really, you know, he's become a, a household name uh, among people compared to um, the past, as opposed to the Sabah election. So it's a long answer, but some of the sort of the thoughts of this process.
I have a question actually for Dr. Bridget. Now, uh, you know, when we look around the, uh, the other countries, um, we have a lot of emerging uh, young leaders. Uh, even in Thailand, there was this attempt to uh, set up the fast forward uh, party with a very charismatic and very dynamic young leader. Um, of course, they didn't call it Muda. He was, he was much smarter. He called it the fast forward. And it represents a very dynamic new generation of voice and alternative. But in Malaysia, we seems to be uh, settled down with uh, old leaders in the 70s, in the 80s, and even in the 90s with the same narrative, with the same script. Uh, when I was in secondary school, they were there. Now that I'm working, I'm almost retiring, they are still there. What is your take on that, Dr. Bridget? I see, uh, I see so much talent among the young Malaysians. Technocratic, merit, merit, you know, really globalized, innovative uh, individuals who want to be part and change the country. They want to change the narrative towards problem solving as opposed to issues associated with uh, the traditional race and religion po politics. The problem is that the electoral system it really is, some, is, a ch is an obstacle because of the first past the post. Uh, they, would have, they have to get an overwhelming level of support to be able to be part and parcel of the, uh, to win the seats. Um, but I do see a whole range of younger people. And surveys show that younger Malaysians have very different outlooks in politics. They, they don't see race quite the same way. Yes, there are some that are very conservative, and they, have, they do have the conservative liberal polarization that we find in Malaysia. But at the same juncture, uh, they don't have the same hang-ups of older generation. So older Malaysians, many of those who have left Malaysia, you know, still think about the NEP. And in the context of Sabah, for example, we can see that the PTI issue really was something that really mattered to those voters who were 35 and above older voters as opposed to younger voters. So the kind of history of the legacies in the have shaped cohorts' per perceptions of politics. Younger Malaysians don't have that. We do, I think, I've said this in other fora, that I think that Said Sadiq uh, needs to make the movement not just about him. And we're starting to see new videos of other Muda leaders talking about their story and their emergence. And these are, they're multi-ethnic, disproportionately. We're finding a, a lot of talented Malaysians across ethnicities, uh, and most of which have been featured so far are among Malays. Um, and people are watching because of what you described. People are fed up. They want things to get done, you know, and they want a country that solves the problems that they can. They want the same sort of life that Malaysia has always had, because Malaysia is a wonderful, you know, it's a wonderful place to be. Uh, there's a sense of comfort, there's a sense of, uh, uh, you know, services working. Yes, this is not to say that there aren't problems, but they're comparatively, Malaysia is a great country and they, and they want people, they want that. Um, and so I do see, I'm optimistic about these younger voices, but I think it's going to take time uh, for the, you know, an optimistic interpretation of what's happening right now is that the older elites are fighting it out. And once, you know, and at this point, there will be space to move in that context. Uh, there are the possibility, other possibilities that can emerge. I'm not saying it's gonna be easy, but I'm also seeing that there are different ways of looking at that. So I do, I'm optimistic about younger people. Thank you. Um, I have one question from Melvin Yap. We have many credible and caliber younger politicians leaders. If we continue to focus on the veteran icon, are we going to see these young leaders lose their passion? Should we just, shouldn't they just start to look for new generations of leaders for the next uh, generation of Malaysians? One of, the one, one of the challenges is, is, is sort of what Sabah shows, right? So Sabah is a situation where parties who had machinery and money were able to be were able to be elected, and they had that they had the advantage to to those that had messaging, such as Shafi Abdal uh, and areas. And they and do keep in mind that Warsum Plus also had its resources. One of the challenges of the younger movement and younger leaders uh, is that they have they have the issue of resources. And so I think what we're seeing among Muda is that they want to talk about crowdfunding, and whether or not we'll see whether or not that emerges as a possibility there. 
And as I mentioned earlier, one of the obstacles is the issue of the electoral system. The other the obstacle is the way campaign financing works in Malaysia, which of course uh, is, a, is, a, is something that people have been calling to, for reform, which has not really have been substantially reformed. The other issue that I think is important to look at is what's happening inside political parties. Now, as I, the reality, if you consider what after 18, the um, uh, automatic registration of 18 comes in, Conservative estimates say that we're going to have a third of the electorate start to change because of automatic registration and because of the new numbers that are going to come in. So the reality is, is that younger candidates are going to have to be slated for parties to be successful. The question becomes which parties will be able to do that and adapt. Now, it, we do see some very good, young, talented leaders in many parties. And I would say, I would start with UMNO. <laughs> I would continue with, uh, with PKR. <laughs> I would continue with DAP. There are lots of young, talented leaders. The problem is that inside these parties is the culture of feudalism and family hierarchy, which prevents these younger leaders to have autonomy, to build their own credibility. They're caught, they're trapped. And so what is involved, interesting to watch is how these younger, how these parties will evolve. It's not going to be enough just to put a young face or a, a, a handsome or pretty face on the ticket. Uh, it's going to be involving to have some fundamental reform within these parties. And I think right now, because everyone is focuses on, focused on, I want to get into power or whose government is forming, they're not thinking about the fundamental sets of reforms that the parties need to do in order to be credible. Now, that doesn't mean that people haven't been, are not aware of that. And I think these realities and pressures, the problem becomes is that if elections are held in six months or in four months, then there, that it's more difficult for these to happen. And one of the reasons why there is pressure to hold elections early, besides the challenges of what's of instability that's happening in the government, is the fact that they don't want the 18-year-olds to come online, and they don't, which are supposed to happen in the middle of next year. So um, they, there is kind of these political realities that, uh, that parties are quite aware of um, in terms of wanting to sort of set the timing for election uh, in these contexts. So uh, I think that the drive will be to move but the problems will be money, the problems will be the party, the political culture, and the problem will be also to change the political narrative outside of the traditional politics of race and religion, uh, money and development, uh, which I think it, it will be interesting to watch. Um, one of the most formative things in the recent history has been digital parliament, which was a parliament of young people who talked about different issue areas and policy. And I think that has left an imprint because many of those things still go online and shared among young people. And I think uh, many people who, who are young at heart have watched these things and said, hey, wait a minute, this is a different type of discussion that, that, that I'm interested in. And there are a lot of people um, across the spectrum, the silent majority, that just want something different. Uh, and, uh, and it's not maybe not the majority, but I would say it's at least 20% of the electorate. And in a competitive contest, this is a very significant uh, share. Uh, and uh, uh, I see this evolving. Thank you. Uh, Dr. West, uh, if, there is, if they were to name one major cause of Warisan Plus losing, what could that be? Only one, the major one. A fatal one. Well, you know, women like to take more than one. Sorry for that, uh, but I, uh, but I, I think that they were there are people who will want to. They'll throw out three words when they talk about uh, uh, about the issue. They'll throw out the PTI issue. They'll throw out mood and yasin, and they'll throw out money. Those are the three things that are there in this context. Huh? Um, you know, those are the issues that they would say as the three factors that they sort of give the area. But I throw out a different word, and that is federal power. All right, okay. uh, I think that the federal, uh, the uses, the power of the machine made all of these things come together in ways that actually worked in favor uh, against Warasan Plus. 
And keep in mind, Wireson Plus was destabilized from July. And that process has been beginning since much earlier than that. So federal power was the reason they wanted this. Uh, they lost. And federal power output is one word together. Okay, thank you. I have a question that I think is more a federal uh, level. Given the discontent of UMNO being played out or bullied, why are UMNO not still forcing a snap election by pulling out of its support for PN? I think that they're playing that card behind the scenes and threatening to pull out. Um, and I think that uh, uh, this is something that was one of the reasons why we saw Anwar make his announcement. And I would see why we see these issues of potential new formulations of uh, instability going looking forward. Uh, but there are also people with an UMNO that are, uh, UMNO is a divided party. There are factions that are more aligned to Mayudin and there are factions that are less aligned. And especially, you know, I think may, things may change, for example, if what happens in the decision with Zahid Hamidi's legal case involving corruption charges. So I think there may be, a, a, you know, part of the pressure can be driven by specific issues involving the, the, legal, the law, law involving, involving legal cases. Um, and so uh, AMNO as a whole, I think, wants elections. They think that they can win. They think that, they, that they've been able, they've shown this in Cheney and Slim through the course of five, six by-elections that they have gained traction uh, with working with PAS. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, the fact is, is that they're not, a, not everyone is on the same page. Um, I do believe that the gatekeeper is not interested in having elections. And if we read the issue of the king in terms of his statements, uh, you know, he continues to focus on the need to manage COVID-19 and the manage to issues of the economy. And I think his interest is in having a stable government and a government that deals with these such issues. So this, of course, is a, is a problem for UMNO uh, from the perspective of uh, that they also need to be able to get, make sure that the gatekeeper is on board in those circumstances. And it's very hard to do that right now, given the, the fact that potentially a second wave for COVID-19 is beginning in the country. And this becomes a, a challenge uh, from the perspective of the political party. Uh, but, you know, the other thing to keep in mind with this question is, is the larger point that I was raising earlier is I'm not, this doesn't have the same power that it had before. You know, this is part of how Malaysia has changed. You know, UMNO in is now part, it may have, you know, it, it is, it just, it's not the same. It may, many people in UMNO think they're the same, but the fact of the matter is they don't have the same level of influence. Uh, and they don't have leadership that is credible at the national stage, uh, at least at the current juncture. Uh, uh, I would say perhaps their deputy could be a very credible leader, my Hassan. But the fact is Zahid Hamidi doesn't have that credibility from a perspective outside of that. And so this is why these are factors that, uh, that have affected UMNO. And we, you know, we talk about UMNO being able to get itself back uh, in this process. It, it's riding on the support, particularly of the Islamist part. It's not their own support quite as much as they think it is. And they're also riding on discontented areas in terms of economic activity and economic realities on the ground. And this is not this is, you know, young people want change, so they're willing to take more risks than the past. Uh, but I think that, you know, the sense that UMNO is the same entity, this kind of patronage working machine, it's not quite. Maybe Chen Wai would like to speak to this. Yeah, yes. um, I mean, uh, Bridget has uh, put it very correctly and accurately of the uh, various, uh, various uh, factions in UMNO and that UMNO is no longer what it used to be, it is still a formidable force because it is very well organized, very structured and very well oiled, but it depends a lot on votes from PAS. And PAS is actually a very powerful player now because unlike uh, UMNO, it has got very stable and very substantial amount of votes and the voters do not, and its voters do not run away. It is always there. It is really a kingmaker. Now, having said that, I like to think 
that the um, general election would still be held, maybe not this year, but very high possibility the first quarter of next year. I say this because the, uh, the Prime Minister would need to table his uh, budget in November and he sh if any politician worth his salt would really table a budget despite, our, despite the constraint of resources and how you're going to finance these uh, projects, but you will use it to the fullest for the election. And then I believe there's a 12th Malaysia plan, which he, if he cleverly uses it, then it is almost a manifesto for the election. Now, uh, the other point is that Sarawak must have its election before June. So time is running out a bit. If uh, Sarawak were to have it uh, separately, it would be quite... Uh, it would be quite difficult. And I think that the federal leaders, and as Bridget says again, federal has a lot of things to say. The federal government would prefer, I think, that the, for the general election to be held together with the Sarawak election. And I think it makes sense because uh, the, in terms of uh, uh, machinery, uh, it, it will be better uh, organized. So time is running out uh, for Mohideen in a way, and time is running out over in Sarawak. And I really believe that the, uh, in the first quarter of next year, election would most probably be held. That's my prediction. Can you hear me, Richard? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, all right, okay. Uh, and uh, I, was, I was just leaving to comment. I think you're probably, it's a good chance as if it's gonna be held soon, it will be held within the next quarter. But I think the only caveat I would say to your remarks is it all depends on COVID. Yeah, I think yes. this is this is the the COVID dimension, and the other thing, part of it is about the the, the issue of the, the the trajectory for the disease. But I also have to think it's also the trajectory of the economic impact. When we see in October after the moratorium is finished, uh, in terms of loans, what will be the impact? I think early next year we're going to start to see uh, businesses being really uh, affected. A lot of people have operated. There's no recovery. It's all on survival mm -hmm. mode from my assessment. Uh, and maybe you could speak to this if you disagree. But I would say that when, you know, when that moratorium ends, which is coming very soon, yes, uh, yeah. then we're going to see reality over the next few months about which companies are going to be able to survive. And, and some parts of Malaysia economy have done very well during COVID-19. I think people don't fully appreciate that. Uh, it's not just the gloves. I'm talking about some electronic sectors, the digitization, and others. But a lot of all, all the smaller businesses in particular have really been very hard hit. Uh, and I think that, uh, and also those in the more vulnerable professions, because uh, Malaysia has the highest level, as I understand it, of ever in the country's history of unemployment. And so these are real, uh, you know, meaningful issues that affect these, the electorates. And I think, you know, I think that any government, despite how much budget and promises you can put in, uh, you're going to have a hard time facing if the economy is, is, is in, this, in, in the recession that was projected, the World Bank just changed its numbers to negative 4.9. Uh, and so, and I think those numbers, uh, nobody really can make numbers in this environment because of the, 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 the uncertainties, but I think they may not even, they may have to be adjusted further uh, and we'll get a better sense of that in the, in the coming months. Absolutely. That's good to know that we are doing well economically. At least we've got something soon have happening. Uh, I think the time is a bit running out. Um, I'm going to take one more question. How do you rate uh, Tan Sri Musi Muhyiddin Yassin's uh, and his team's performance? I think, you know, we can look at a glass and see the glass half full and half empty. Let me tell you some of the positives first. I think he, he has gained a lot of popularity in, because, in part because of his kind of grassroots style, uh, appealing to certain segments of the population. Uh, but I would also say because he hasn't engaged in the politic wrang wrangling that had been uh, uh, of the past in terms of the Pakistan Harapan government. The lack of, you know, sort of taking on politicking uh, has actually sort of put it, seen, at least portrayed himself as being away from politics. That's not the reality, but that's in terms of public perceptions. I think that that is an important dimension. 
And uh, I think uh, in terms of the COVID-19 management from a perspective of the disease, uh, I, this has been seen extremely positive because he's been given credit for all the fiscal stimulus projects, pro programs, which ironically began at Pakistan and Harafan, but were implemented and expanded under Wuyudin uh, Yassin. And, you know, when 1,600 ringgit or 500 ringgit or 300 ringgit hits certain groups of people in Malaysia, the fact that it really matters for them is an indication of where people live in terms of vulnerability and the high household debt and all the other challenges that they are there. But Muhyiddin Yassin has been very effective in doing that. The same way I would argue that Najib bin Razak did when he first introduced the BRIM program in 2013, uh, um, uh, and around that time when it began to be introduced. So what I would say is that the uh, he's he's been seen uh, quite successful. Um, in terms of managing the economy, I think this is probably an area where there's probably a lot more division in perspective. Uh, uh, I think that uh, his, there has no clear vision or plan, and, uh, and the focus has been on creating stimulus packages, but they've been unevenly distributed. And, uh, and I think while there's been considerable outreach to certain parts of the business community, and many parts of the business community are happy, because the previous government was seen to taxing them too much and not necessarily delivering, uh, what we see is a situation where um, there is no sense of long-term projections and the political instability of the Mood and Yasin government undermines uh, the economic issues of economic stability. Uh, and there is a sense that, uh, that you know, um, it's almost business as usual. So there's lots of contracts being distributed. And while the media hasn't necessarily covered all of these to the same degree, there, is a, there are concerns that, that there are considerable leakages taking place in the economy that may come to the fore as things move forward. So I think that it's a question of planning, vision, and the structural dimensions of economic reform, which are not taking place. Uh, and economic vision that I think that are a little bit less of a, a, a problem for the Asin Fumuyudin's leadership. Um, the other big problem from a perspective of Mu'yudin Yassin is that I would argue that race relations in Malaysia, with the exception of Sabah, uh, and the Sabah elections have worsened um, during this government, uh, they, particularly from the perspective of non-Muslims. And, uh, and this has kind of reinforced some of the polarization. And that uh, is something that's very, you know, it's quite common in polarized political processes where, where one type of government is, is in and then another government comes in. We saw this, for example, in the United States when Obama period versus the Trump administration. The same thing in the context of Malaysia. There is not seen to be adequate non-Malay inclusion in the Mu'ud and Yassin government. And this has seen, it's created a lot of disquiet uh, and, and, and concern. It's not often spoken, but, uh, but often when it is spoken, it's quite strongly spoken. So I think that there is a sense that, uh, of unease. Uh, uh, and that is a very worrying dimension, especially if it becomes polarized as it has been in the past. So, you know, it's a quite, here are good things uh, uh, from the perspective of uh, popularity and messaging and, and some deliverables, uh, but in terms of long-term economic planning and kind of addressing some of the kind of divisions in society um, and the issues of legitimacy and corruption issues, I think there are real challenges for immediate assets leadership. Okay. And why, you have any last words that uh, you want to wrap it up? We can't hear again. We need to get a new mic. <laughs> Okay, and uh, just, okay, just want to share something. Um, actually, when I'm talking to the friends in Hong Kong, what Malaysia has done with the six months loan moratoriums, in fact, I think this is really, really very, very helpful, and we are very impressed what he had, what he has done. I mean, it's, uh, for a guy that lost his job, and they don't have to pay for the installments and the interest, uh, in terms of cash flow, is a big help. I mean. I think when I speak to my friends in Hong Kong, they, they were actually very, very impressed of what Malaysia has done in that uh, aspect. And it did very well and helped a lot of companies to survive in, in this pandemic. Okay, with that, um, I think we need to wrap it up. And uh, again, once again, I'm gonna thank uh, Dr. Bridget Welsh, uh, Wong Chung Wai for your valuable time. And uh, we do hope to see you again and maybe in the live sections in Hong Kong. 
Thank you very much. And uh, this uh, recording will be on uh, YouTube and we'll basically uh, sending out the links uh, once the, we finish editing it. Thank you very much and uh, thank you. see you all Bye -bye. Thanks for the kind invitation. Thanks for, for your comments. I wish I could have heard more. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Cheers.